Hey, it's Martin here with your weekly roundup of all the interesting things going on in the world of property and pizza and sausages and old television shows. Yes, it's my property clinic. Make sure you like this. And remember, that's not a lifelong commitment. It's just a like and also subscribe. Now, that is more serious, but I promise I'll be good to you. Oh, yes. You know, this is the deal. You send me your questions on a Monday, Ask Martin Monday, hashtag Ask Martin Monday. Uh, it's on my Twitter account, which is at TV Martin Roberts. Tweet, tweet, go to the bird. And uh, yeah, it could be anything. Okay, let's start. Matthew Foster. Hello, Matthew. Oven chips. Do you turn once halfway through cooking as per instructions or play it as it lies? Well, oven chips. Now, here's the thing about oven chips. Until very recently, I hadn't found an oven chip that I felt did justice to the whole chip world, okay? Uh, there are they always came out a bit, what's the word, kind of cremated around the edges. Not, you know, I mean, you cut, my, my granny, ugh, ugh, rumble, rumble, my granny used to make the most amazing chips. I think granny, is, what, is that just a universal thing about grannies? Could they always make chips really well? I don't know, anyway, she could. But, and the way she did it was she, she like, cut the chips up, right, the potatoes, and then she cooked them really slowly on a, on a, on a sort of low heat. So that the potatoes got kind of like soft. And then she took the, the, the little basket of the chips out and then she would superheat the oil. But then she would heat it and then she'd put the things back just to like crisp off around the edges. Now they were absolutely amazing. Now, I have to say, in my quest to find a better frozen chip, I did stumble across some triple cooked chips, goose fat triple cooked chips in Lidl. And I have to say, they were pretty blooming great. So uh, to come back to Matthew's rather interesting question, do you turn them halfway through? Well, yes, I think you should. Um, but I think it all starts out, it's not gonna be, you know, the end product is only as good as the sum of the starting bits. They weren't that much more expensive either. So I think look out for those triple cooked chips in Lidl's. Yum, yum, yum. All right, Sally Brumer. Uh, she asked this question, what is the best pun you've ever done? The followers of my Facebook page, Brilliant Puns from Homes of the Hammer, deserve to know. Well, if it's the Facebook page, Brilliant Puns from Homes of the Hammer, that is pretty extraordinary. I think that the, the whole punny thing is definitely something which has become a bit of a hmm, trait of the show. My mum was used to do it, she was heavily into her puns when I was growing up, and sort of, I think I started the whole thing, and um, yeah, it's now fantastic. There was one episode, we did a toilet block, so I decided, how many toilet puns can you get into a piece of camera? This is the bit I'm talking, obviously, or rather a feature. So we actually had like a little thing, a counter on the screen, and I had to come up with all these different puns about toilets. And uh, you know, this one's going down the pan, and then this went on and on and on. During a project like this, to drive around the bend, da 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 da. Anyway, I think we got up to about twenty-seven puns, but my favourite one was definitely something along the lines of "You or I all know this will be a great success." It was a real fringe one, but. People knew what I meant, and it was a great pun. So uh, thank you for that question, Sally. I hope that makes it up onto your um, onto your Facebook page. How exciting is that? Okay, Christian, will a summer house or a guest room add value to my house? Well, I think it could. Uh, now look, value, it depends on how much space it adds. Um, uh, I mean, obviously guest room, extra bedrooms, people like extra bedrooms, a summer house. Well, that sounds good. As long as you don't tend to spend too much on it, um, I think it's gonna add value. I mean, I would have thought a summer house would be a little thing to have. Anyway, don't forget, it's really important when it comes to doing renovations and jobs on houses that you don't just do it for the money, all right? Well, you do part of it for the money, right? But if you're living in a place, how much increase in your quality of life is it gonna bring you? And in which case, the equation becomes a little bit more, you know, complicated because yes, it might add value, but it's gonna add quality of life. And especially after what we've been through, we all know that improving the kind of space around us is something that's really important. So Christian, I would jolly well go for it, whatever. Now, Chris Pugh, hello, Chris. He said, Prue, sorry, Prue, Chris Prue. When on Homes Under the Hammer, you talk about a 3% yield for renting, what does that mean and how is it calculated? So we talk about a 3% yield. Yield, very simply, is the amount of money you get back as a percentage of the amount of money you've had to put in and it can apply to anything. So if um, I put a hundred pounds in a bank and that gives me each year three pounds, so I get three pounds back for whatever, that is a 3% yield because three is 3% of 100. Likewise, if I put £100,000 into a property and I get £3,000 a year back from it, that's 3%. 
back on my money. Now, you slightly more complicated than that because you've got to factor in before or after costs. And most people would want to know the after costs yield. So, if you've got a house, say it's bring, it costs you £100,000, let's say it's bringing you in £10,000 a year from rent or whatever, that's a 10% yield on your 100,000 quid. 10,000 is 10% 10 of 100,000. But you might have to take off things like mortgage costs and agents fees and stuff like that so the net yield as in what you've got left might be only five thousand pounds so that would be five percent so that's the that's the basic gist of yield and they're just a good way to sort of cross-reference different property investment opportunities because you might just go for yield you might go for something which is delivering you lots of money back or you might go for capital growth and a lot of people sort of work on both of those. And there's lots and lots and lots of information about that um, in um, all the property training stuff that I do, which you can find out about at martinrobertpropertyeducation.com, uh, where I do seminars and uh, live trainings and uh, online stuff as well with Asset Academy. So check that out. And, and also, if you check out the Property Masterclass uh, on this YouTube channel, uh, I'm going to be covering lots and lots of issues when it comes to that stuff. And I might even talk about you. In fact, I think I already have talked about you. So yeah, check out the videos which are on there. But thank you. Anyway, Chris, Theo. Hello, Theo. Does the show, Homes and the Hammer, tend to focus on certain areas of the UK, perhaps due to the location of the auction houses? Well, yes, and it is exactly because of that, because of the location of the auction houses. The more active auction houses, the ones with more lots, uh, tend to be ones that deliver us more people who will take part in the show, because believe it or not, some people don't want to take part in the show. So we will have a room full of 100 people buying 100 properties, and only six of them will end up being on the show. Not because we don't want them to be, but because they don't want to be. You know, people want to do their own thing, they want to be private about it, or whatever. So it, we do need to go to auctions where there are a reasonable number of properties being sold. And, you know, historically that is your Derby's, that is your London's, that's just your, your, your Manchester areas. Um, you know, there are lots and lots of auctions all around the country. Gosh, my, my golly, there's, there's an auction happening most weeks. Uh, I mean, obviously not at the moment because of what's happening, but online auctions have, have taken over at the moment. But I'm hoping that we will see a return to real auctions before very long, or actually in the room auction type. No. Oh, thanks. No. Ah. No. That was strange. Right. Yeah. Bear with me. Sorry. Sorry. Ignore that bit, please. Do not show me leaving. Um, Theo. Hopefully, when all this is over, we'll be back at real auctions, as in, not real auctions, but auctions that uh, are actually taking place in a physical a physical place, and we'll be back. Um, so, yeah, keep your, keep your eyes peeled for that one. Uh, okay. Oh, wow, I like this one. Mandrake Fraser. This is a question and a half. This is just out there, but brilliant. If all houses were banished from the earth and you had to live in a giant crisp of your choice, what crisp or which crisp would you choose to live in? Well, irrespective of uh, the answer, that has to be the best question. <laughs> Don't put that in either. Irrespective of the answer to this question, the question itself has to be the most out there, brilliant question uh, we've had so far. I mean, I have to say, I would probably go for prawn cocktail because that's because of kind of like sea feel to it. So I think if you were doing, um, if you're living in a prawn cocktail flavored crisp, you might actually be by the seaside and that'd be nice. Salt and vinegar, I'm not sure I'd live in a, want to live in a salt and vinegar crisp. I think actually, when it comes down to it, I'd probably live in a monster munch. You know, pickled onion monster munch. Got to be the way to go. But great question, Mandrake. Absolutely off the wall, but brilliant. Gareth Greenshields, why do you never mention the square footage of the properties on your show? Well, I mean, we kind of do a bit. I mean, I try to ish. I'll make, I'll make a note to self, make mention property square footages in future. Uh, and square footages are quite useful for, for working out costs. I mean, a lot of property prices are based on price per square foot. So if you know the square foot, you can kind of work it out. So I don't know, we will. Thank you very much. No, to tell. Tom van Eyck. Hello for the Netherlands. Hello, Tom in the Netherlands. I can't speak Dutch, but I will say um, hi, because I'm sure hi. That tends to work in most of Europe, doesn't it? Hello, hello, hello. Hello for the Netherlands. Hello. So often buyers don't do their homework, even though you always tell them to do so. Have you had any experience where it went really, really wrong? And if so, wouldn't it be educational to show? Well, I'll be honest, Tom, we do show every single thing, whether it goes well or whether it goes badly. I actually quite like it when things don't go particularly brilliantly. They only just showcase the fact that if you get it wrong, you know, it can be quite, you know, have serious ramifications and you need to take this seriously. You need to really you need to do your numbers, you need to, you know, be 
careful about investing large sums of money. You never, ever, ever invest if it's going to stress you out. Um, well, a little bit of stress, but not like, you know, sleepless nights kind of, it's not worth it, right? I will just say one little recollection. There was a property that a couple of builders bought and they thought they knew it all, right? And they were very good. They came on the show and they admitted the fact they completely messed this one up. It was a house. It was a two up, two down terrace in Manchester. And from the outside, it looked fine. And they bought it based on the picture in the auction catalogue, right? When they got there, they found out that it had a hole in the roof, right? And water had been pouring in for years. And so that all the woodwork in the property was absolutely shot. So in the end, they reckoned it was going to cost them about 25 grand, more than they had anticipated, to do this place up. That was basically their entire profit. So they lost it. The thing was that two doors up, there was a property that sold in the same auction, same street. It hadn't had a hole in the roof. It sold for the same amount of money. So if they'd only gone to visit it and seen it, they would have realised they should have gone for that one. Huh, whatever. But they came on the show and told us that. So I was I was really happy that they did. So we do show things when it goes wrong, when we can. But I would say on balance, you know, most of the time it seems to go all right for people because they work very hard and, uh, you know, they, they, they do their research and dot it are. So Kirst asks, is it an actual thing to invest in property without using your own money or not? So I guess it's the holy grail, isn't it? Is to try and buy a, a place place using somebody else's money or without having to put too much of your own money down because getting that deposit in the early stages I know is a really really tough thing to do. I had to save my own deposit in the first place it takes ages and you know it, it, as property prices have gone up it just gets more and more and more seemingly un unaffordable. There are ways that you could do this. There are lots of clever things that we teach in uh, my property training courses, for instance, about all sorts of clever stuff. It's a little thing called a lease option, a very, very clever way of investing in property without having to come up with too much money. I'm not a financial advisor. I'm not qualified to give you financial advice. So it's really important that you do seek independent advice before you make any investment decision uh, whatsoever. But there are things you can do. But on a simple way and it just got you get you thinking outside the box here it might be that you know somebody in your social circle or your family who has got a reasonable amount of money maybe sitting away and you know they made, made some money from selling a house or from a business or just whatever that they might be thinking oh i wish i could invest this somewhere more than i'm getting in my you know 0.0 percent being in the uh, you know in, in the building society or whatever and and you might be able to structure a deal with them say look okay i've got the enthusiasm i've got the skills i'm going to go and find some properties to develop but i don't have any money you've got the money you haven't got the time so why can we come up with some kind of collaboration where you provide the funding and i'll provide all the effort um and if you draw up a proper structured agreement from that point of view uh, it could be that there's a nice little symbiotic relationship can go on there but you must go through this to make sure that everyone is there's no misunderstanding in terms of how that's all going to work because it's very important because you don't want to get yourself into a situation so okay so there you go so there's, there's, there's complicated ways and there's simple ways uh, and uh, if you want to find out more about the complicated ways uh, look through some of my property training stuff and uh, you'll find out amy hello amy she says how do i apply to be on homes under the hammer wow well, you can't really apply to be on it. You just have to go to an auction where we happen to be filming and buy a property, and then we will ask you if you'd like to be on the show. I mean, it's as simple as that. Uh, it's just a you know, sort of extreme way to get on the show, I guess. People have done it. I mean, no j joking apart, I have known people who've actually bought a property at an auction just so they can be on homes with them. I mean, that's dedicated fans for you, right? I mean, hopefully they made loads of money out of it or got themselves a lovely property at the same time, but wow. Okay, Ziggy Played Guitar says, Hi Martin, when the world resumes to normality, will it ever? <laughs> Hopefully. Do you think it would be wise to put our house on the market? That was our plan pre-lockdown, so unsure if it's still unrealistic. Well, you know what? You don't have to sell it. You can put it on the market and if you don't like the price you're being offered, don't sell it. Okay, it's as simple as that. So, um, you know, I don't know. I, I don't know. It's going to be a while before the data comes through in terms of how the market's reacted. Anecdotal evidence is that it's it's pretty busy out there. And I think, you know, a lot of pent up demand and, and things. I, I don't think it's necessarily a bad time to stick your house on the market. Uh, James Hamley writes, Hi Martin, would you invest in two properties in a worse area or one in a good area? Ooh, better returns on two, but less hassle on one. Well, you know, they do say, I mean, to, to, to miss quote or quote you know another tv show location 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 is everything okay and so i would probably do the one in a good area but if it's a reasonable area and you are getting some really good yields we talked about yields earlier then maybe you can consider the two and it's about just weighing up all the options and then jumping headfoot into one of them oh yeah here's an interesting one john asks 
Is the show going to feature online auctions at some point due to social distancing? I'm not sure, uh, but I believe that Homes and the Hammer will be featuring online auctions um, as part of uh, the stuff going forward. What's this space? I can't guarantee that, but um, until the auction houses are, are back in full swing, I don't think we're gonna have much option. So yeah, I think we will be featuring online auctions because a lot of the auction houses that we, we featured previously do are doing online auctions, so, so why, why shouldn't we? Um, in the current climate, final few questions here. Bernard Lounge Carpet, how do you steer a hot air balloon? Wow, that's interesting. It's a good question. You don't steer them, I don't think, or you could have a little um, battery operated fan at the back perhaps you could have a dog with a very waggy tail uh that sort of blew the whole thing along you could eat lots of beans and let's not go too far on that one um, but i think most of the time you drift with the breeze and that's part of the joy of hot air balloon isn't it you don't quite know where you can go you have to just trust to i presume you don't set off uh <laughs> oh god hot air balloons hey here's the story right i went hot air ballooning i've been several times uh, for, for hot air ballooning which is quite interesting you think it's going to be peaceful and tranquil well it's obvious when they're not burning the burner because when they burn the burner it's like being inside an oven <laughs> And it's like so hot, it's just, uh, wow. Um, so yeah, but we, I, I was very lucky. Years ago, I used to do some travel reporting for a, for a radio show called Breakaway on Radio 4. Don't you remember it? It was great. Bert Fox presented it when I started out. And I actually went b -b 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 ballooning over the Bavarian Alps, which sounds dead good, doesn't it? Yeah, well, it was. The first bit was superb. Wow, look, Bavarian Alps. They look pretty, don't they? How nice to be high up looking down rather than low down looking up. Uh, but anyway, yeah, so it was fine. But then the slightly gung ho pilot seriously messed up the landing. And we were coming down. Oh, I don't know what about balloons but I my image is that you float gently to the ground well he didn't seem to be following that uh, kind of plan really you know and he approached the ground with far too high velocity and I remember I was recording it with a tape recorder and uh, so it was a while ago it was actually a tape recorder <laughs> the Sony Walkman tape recorder yeah. And I was going, oh, no, we're coming into London. And we seem to be coming down very fast. Very, very fast. Very fast indeed. And then there's all this sort of screaming. And then there's this burn. It's going, <sighs> as he's trying to overcompensate. And uh, we smashed into the ground. It was like, oh, arms and legs everywhere. And I think it was a couple of journalists from the Wolverhampton Daily Echo or something. And I got feet in my face. And it blah, bang. And of course, the problem was then, the, the thing with balloons is there's this kind of like a reaction. There's a delayed reaction. So his burning then flayed the balloon. Whoosh, we took off again. So we're like, rah! Oh my God, we're being dragged through this field of corn and there's corn going everywhere. Like, well, I got the foot of the man from the wood and I'm doing an echo in my face and corn everywhere. And put it, uh, we've been pulled through this field. Um, and uh, eventually we kind of came to a grinding halt and we all this tumbled wreckage in there. Um, and, uh, you know, um, I sort of stood up and felt very, very poorly and I'd broken three ribs. Oh my gosh, don't ever do that. Ah, that's my ballooning story. How do you steer a hot air balloon? You, you ideally do it very carefully. Best. Right, final question. This is from Craig. Hello, Craig. Why is there not a board game based on Homes and the Hammer? It would be a winner. I completely agree. We are going to have to do a Homes and the Hammer board game. And uh, I think absolutely we should. I've got to come up with lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of ideas and things we could do. Uh, superfluous to the show, but um, I think we just have to. so busy making it. Nah. <laughs> and the celery stuff never quite seems to happen. Those are your questions on Martin Brum's Property Clinic. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure you like this. Make sure you subscribe and send me your questions. Ask, ask, a little, hashtag, Ask Martin Monday on my Twitter, at TV Martin Roberts. And we'll be back with more of this stuff next time.